If there is one single thread to everything that I have worked on, more or less, and what interests me, it is the nature of the modern world, or the origins of modernity. Many people talk about modernity and post-modernity and pre-modernity and so on without really thinking about what they mean by it. And of course we all have different definitions. My definition is very simple. There are four different parts of our lives, institutional parts of an individual's lives. There is how we create wealth, money, markets, agriculture, and so on. So the creation of wealth, which we roughly call economics and the economy. The creation of meaning, ideas, religions, beliefs, ideology, that area. The, crea the maintenance of order, that is power, force, and so on, which we call politics. And the way we relate to other people, society, family, friends, that whole social sphere. Those are the four. Now, normally in societies, for most of human history, they've been all together and not divided. Later, they became partly divided in civilizations. And then, what I mean by modernity is a world where all four are of course related, but only find a particular place in one individual. I as an individual am a worker, I'm a producer, etc., an economic agent, an actor. I have my own beliefs and ideas and aspirations and uh, so I have an independent ideological being. I'm related to people as a social person and a social actor and I have my own force and political beliefs and political activities. But I'm not part of anything bigger which constrains me entirely in any of these and they are anyone, even my wife and closest friends and so on, have differences from me in all these aspects. They believe different things, they have different economies and so on. So basically in modernity we've split all these things apart. This is very unusual. It appears to be recent in most parts of the world, still has not been attained in many parts of the world. It's the thing that is denied and crushed in all totalitarian systems like fascism or communism. It wasn't present in much of Europe before the French Revolution. And yet, here we are in parts of the world, in America, Scandinavia, England and so on, inhabiting a world where we at least attempt to keep all these spheres apart. How did this happen? Well, it's puzzled me for many years and I've approached it in different ways. Recently, I've approached it using another of the Holmes and uh, Dupin uh, detective methods, which is the questioning of the world that surrounds you. It's obviously the case that as human beings we don't notice things which are too familiar. This is famously put in a Chinese proverb ascribed to Confucius that it wouldn't be likely that it would be a bird that discovered the air, or a fish that discovered water, we just swim in it. And so there are many things about one's own culture and upbringing which are so close that you don't question them and you don't think they're odd or needing explanation. And this has been the case with me for many years, particularly about my own growth and from infancy through childhood up to where I am now. These are so deep, the way you were brought up 
and particularly the schooling system, the university system and so on, which I went through. But really, they seem normal, not needing explanation. It's other people's systems which seem odd and worth investigating. And that's what I've done in much of my life as an anthropologist. But in fact, it's the very normal, the things that surround you, which may give you a key. And I think give us a key to the nature of modernity and how it's constructed in particular. It's a point that's made again by Holmes, um, who um, noted, noted that the world is full of obvious things which nobody by any chance ever observes. Or again, he says, it is just those very simple things which are extremely liable to be overlooked. Again, in one case, he says, um, I'm, af I'm afraid, said I, that the facts are so obvious that you will find little credit to be gained out of this case. That's uh, Watson. Holmes replies, there is nothing more deceptive than an obvious fact, he answered laughingly. So, what is it? What is the water in which I swim, and how could it have contributed to my being what I think of as a modern human being? It's particularly, I think, the education system. This has come out home to me particularly in the last three or four years when I've been working in China, comparing Chinese education with English education historical education in both places up to the present. Of course, they're merging and coming close together now, but for many centuries the educational system of the English were, was different from that in almost all other countries, including continental countries. What was the heart of it? Well, the heart of it, of course, is what I went through, and I didn't really think about it too much in detail, and that is that from a very early age, I was sent away from home. Now, I was physically sent away from home because I came home from India as a little boy of five to England, and my parents then went back to India, and I was looked after by my grandparents, so I was set, split off from my family of mother and father. And then at the age of eight, I was sent off to a British private boarding school dumped in a dormitory with a whole lot of strangers and told to get on with it. And from then on, from the age of eight onwards, I only came home for holidays. I went to this school from eight to thirteen, another from thirteen to eighteen, and then to university and so on. So I never went home. Now, this cut the link with my family, but I thought of it was absolutely normal. I also thought it was probably quite a recent thing, that public schools, private schools were a recent 19th century invention. And it was only when I started looking backwards and studying education in the past and the social structure of England, I discovered it was a very, very old tradition, going back to the Anglo-Saxons. In particular, it was famously described by an Italian visitor to England, who later became a Pope, Trevisano, and he described how the English, as he described it, were very cruel to their children. They sent them away at the age of eight or nine, and it would be it's bad enough to do that, but they never had them back again. They went off into the world, they made their way with the help of friends and patrons, and they were split off from their family, which was entirely different from what he'd experienced in Italy. Now, he was talking about one group, but in fact it went across the whole of the English spectrum. If you were poor, you were sent off as a servant at seven, eight, nine, ten. If you were slightly better off, your parents could afford it. You were apprenticed to a master at a roughly the same age. If you were better off, you might go to a grammar school or um, another kind of school. And if you were very, very wealthy, you might go into the household of a lord. But basically, the English sent their children off. Most of their children had left home by the age of 12 or 13. Legally, they were independent, they didn't send their wages back, they would visit their parents, of course, but they became strangers to their parent. It's described by John Locke, the philosopher, in his treatise on education. This is what you do. 
you split off from your family. And this mechanism, which can lead to a great deal of pain, isolation, loneliness, as I found in my own education, is the toughening up, the separation off into an autonomous individual. And without it, it's very difficult to see how you can have people who operate absolutely independently, who are, in the famous story of Defoe, Robinson Crusoe on his island, alone but complete. Robinson Crusoe didn't need anyone, though he might have found Man Friday, but he was a separate religious, social, economic, political entity and could survive like that. This complex, which is so unusual and so much the basis for modernity, is generated by a particular educational system. It doesn't necessarily mean you have to be ejected from your home. I've watched my grandchildren growing up and seen how even though they go walk up to school and live in their home, from a very early age, 12, 13, they become adult, uh, independent, separate from their parents, and prepared to leave home for good later in their lives. This is something which is very unusual, is not found on the whole in the same psychological and social way in any other country in Europe. Um, bits of it are found here and there, of course, and you find it in America, of course, and it's spreading it's spread in India and China and elsewhere with the Western educational systems. But it's unusual, but it was surrounding me so much that I couldn't see it until I went elsewhere and looked back at my own culture and saw the kind of air I was breathing and the water that surrounded me and that the most obvious things are in many ways the most exciting and interesting. Thank you. Again, if any of that uh, wants you to read further, I'm writing various books about my own life and education, but there is one chapter in this book which was given a series of lectures in China called the invention of the modern world and there's a chapter on education there which in a very brief form summarizes some of what I've been talking about.